So this video is about the Gram Schmidt, possibly pronounced incorrectly, uh, process, which is really, really important in linear algebra. And it comes up again and again in loads of different cases. So for example, uh, I don't know, conjugate gradients. In particular, it forms a key part of the uh, QR decomposition which is kind of a classic approach um, for finding eigenvalues, which is something that we'll probably look at in the, in the next video. Um, but it forms part of, of loads and loads of stuff, so it's really, really important. And what we do is we consider the case where we start off with um, so a bullet point of a set of linearly um, independent vectors, that's going to be a V1, let's say to Vn. We've discussed linear independence already in our previous two videos about the, the power method. So while these Vs are linearly independent, they're not necessarily orthogonal. And what we want to do, again, orthogonality discussed in the previous videos on the power method, um, is we want to create an orthogonal set of vectors, which we're going to write as a Q1, let's say to a Q uh, n. And what we say is we want those orthogonal vectors to have the same span as, um, as our linearly independent vectors. So we're introducing this term span, which has a specific meaning um, in linear algebra. So to work out what span means, if we look at these vectors and um, defined by the, the v's, um, it, it, it's essentially all the linear combinations that you can create from these vectors. So the span whoops, of the set of vectors, so v1 to vn, is all linear combinations of these vectors. So let's just say for example, it's equal to the summation from i equals 1 to n of some constant, which I'm going to write as an alpha, multiplied by the vector vi. So it's everything you can create by changing these, these constants. So it's every vector that you could create through a linear combination of the v's. And then if we write, let's say, the span of Q1 to Qn, then we're going to say that's the summation. I'm going to have a different constant here, so let's use betas as a constant instead of these Qs. And when we use the Gram-Schmidt process, we want to find an orthogonal set of vectors Q that span the same space as V. So practically speaking, that means that any vector you can make out of a linear combination of these Vs, then you'll be able to recreate that vector using a linear combination of Qs just multiplied by potentially different constants. So you'd be able to find betas that could then recreate any vector that could be made by a linear combination of the Vs. And so it's, it's kind of an orthogonalization process, if you like. So the whole thing is about saying, well, we've got these vectors already. They're linearly independent. Um, we want to create a new orthogonal set that has the same span. So we have our vectors uh, v1 to vn that are linearly independent, but they're not orthogonal. And what we want to do is create the vectors q1 to qn which are orthogonal and span the same space as our v-vectors. We're going to start off just by simply picking q1 is equal to v1. So that's our uh, first vector sorted. You have to start somewhere. And we're going to pick q2 by saying we want that q2 is equal to vector v2 
plus some constant times q1. And then what we want to do is choose the constant alpha so that q2 is orthogonal to q1. So to do that, we're going to pre-multiply by q1 transposed. So it's equal to q1 transposed b2 plus alpha q1 transposed q1. Now by definition, we want q1 and q2 to be orthogonal. So this is equal to zero. Therefore, what we have is that alpha q1 transposed q1 plus q1 transposed v2 is equal to zero. And so that tells us that if we want q1 to be orthogonal, so sorry, if we want q2 to be orthogonal to q1, that is, we want to choose q2 so that it's orthogonal to q1, then we should set alpha equal to minus q1 transposed v2 divided by q1 transposed q1. So just rearranging this. So substituting alpha back into here, what we're saying is that you should set q2 is equal to v2 minus uh, this alpha that we've uh, solved for multiplied by q1. And you can do this because you have uh, your v2 already and we also have our q1 already. Okay, so that's fine. Now we're going to move on to pick uh, q3. What we're going to say is we want q3 to be equal to the vector v3 plus we're going to have another constant, let's call it a beta times q1 plus a gamma times q2. Very similar procedure now but basically we're going to choose these constants beta and gamma so that q3 is orthogonal to q1 and now q2. So very similar thing we're going to pre-multiply by q1 transposed so it's equal to q1 transposed v3 plus beta the constant we're yet to find q1 transposed q1 plus gamma another constant we want to find q1 transposed q2 okay so by definition q1 transposed q2 is equal to zero because we did that in the previous step we deliberately chose a q2 that's orthogonal to q1 and also we want it to be the case we want to choose these constants so that q1 transposed q3 is zero we want those to be orthogonal too and so after all of that what we find is that uh, so I'll write it out in full q1 transposed v3 plus beta q1 transposed q1 is equal to zero therefore beta will be equal to uh, so just rearranging this minus q1 transposed v3 divided by q1 transposed q1 so that's beta sorted now to get gamma we're going to pre-multiply by q2 so very similar now very similar process i'm sure you can see where this is going but q2 transposed q3 is equal to q2 transposed v3 plus our, our beta which we have found now but we'll just see this through so q2 transposed q1 plus gamma that we're yet to find q2 transposed q2 okay so we found beta but it doesn't really matter 
um, because we've already chosen, as we say, Q2 to be orthogonal to Q1. So this is going to disappear. Likewise, we want to enforce that Q2 and Q3 are orthogonal, so that's going to disappear as well. And so rearranging this in exactly the same way um, as just previously, then we can see that gamma will be equal to a minus Q2 transpose B3 divided by Q2 transpose Q2. Okay. So we put all of that together and what you end up with is that this third vector, Q3, is equal to a V3 uh, minus, so this was our uh, beta, it's going to be a Q1 transposed V3 divided by Q1 transposed Q1 multiplied by Q1 then minus again, so this is going to be our gamma, so it's just up here, Q2 transposed V3 divided by Q2 transposed Q2 multiplied by vector Q2. So you can see as we proceed iteratively we can keep finding these new Qs. So for example in this case, what do we need to find Q3? Well, we need V3, which we had already, and the only other things that we need are the Q1s and Q2s. And we found those in the basically the previous iterations of the, of the algorithm. And if you keep going, you can see the pattern. It's relatively easy to see that in general, if you want to find vector Qj, so we've already found Q1 to Qj minus 1 by this point in previous iterations of the algorithm, then this is equal to vj minus summation from, so here I'm going to use an i, i equals 1, j minus 1, and basically we've got these, these constants here. So we're going to have a q i transposed, because you can see this increases. Uh, this is like a, I'm just wrapping all this into a single summation multiplied by Vj, so you can see that V3 is consistent, uh, it's always V3 in these terms, um, and then divided by Qi transposed Qi, uh, again multiplied by Qi on the end. And that completes uh, the algorithm, essentially. So now we're going to try and think about what's happening geometrically by defining something called the projection operator. So let's imagine we have a vector x and a vector y. Then if you draw, let's say some dashed lines here, if this is a right angle, then this vector here going to call P, is the projection of Y onto X. In other words, it's the component of Y that's acting in the X direction. By definition, P points in the same direction as X, so this is equal to a constant that we don't know, multiplied by X. Now through vector addition, we know that if you let's say travel along the vector y and then travel along the vector minus p then you'll end up here so you end up actually orthogonal to x so that vector there is equal to y minus p as we said this vector is orthogonal to x and so by definition that means we can write that um, x transposed multiplied by y minus p is equal to 0. And so x transposed y minus x transposed p is equal to 0. We then substitute in 
that p is equal to a constant times x because p points in the same direction as the vector x. So we find that x transposed y minus constant x transposed x is equal to zero. Therefore, after rearranging this, you find that the constant is equal to x transposed y divided by x transpose x. So putting these things together, we end up with the projection is equal to the constant, which we've just um, found, just geometrically multiplied by the vector x. And we introduce a bit of notation here to make this a bit simpler to write down. We take all of this stuff and instead of writing it down each time and remembering what this represents geometrically, we write this down as the projection onto x of y. So now we've got this definition of the projection operator, we'll plug it back into our Gram-Schmidt algorithm to see what geometrical interpretation that gives us. So going back to our algorithm, we now know that we can write qj is equal to vj minus the same summation over i equals 1 to j minus 1. And then here we're going to write the projection onto qi of vj. So we're going to look at what this means starting in two dimensions. So let's say we have our vector v1 and a vector v2, which I've drawn um, deliberately so that they are linearly independent, but they are not orthogonal. Remember that we start off by setting q1 equal to v1. Then the second iteration of our algorithm, when we're trying to find q2, what we do is we set q2 is equal to v2 minus the projection onto q1 of v2. Okay, so the projection onto v1 of q2 is the component of, of uh, sorry, projection onto q1 of v2, we draw another dashed line here, is equal to that vector there. Okay, that's the component of v2 which is acting along v1. And we're saying that q2 is v2 minus this projection. So you can see that if you go uh, travel along this vector and then travel in the negative uh, along the negative component of the projection of v2 onto q1, then we end up here. So you've gone along here and then along here to arrive at this vector which we call Q2. And so geometrically, you can see that Q2 is going to be orthogonal to Q1. So now I'm going to try and give another example um, for the next iteration. So when you're trying to find Q3, although it's not very easy to draw, but we'll give it a go. So uh, iteration three. So let's say you've already found your Q1 and your Q2. Now you want to find Q3. Um, then we know that this is going to be set as equal to v3 minus the projection onto q1 of v3 and then minus the projection onto q2 of v3. So down here I'm going to draw, again attempting some 3D, let's say that this is q1 and this is q2 which is by definition orthogonal to q1 and then I'm going to draw this vector uh, v3 which okay so through these dashed lines are going to try and indicate where it lies so if we draw this dashed line down to here 
then that's where it lies on the Q1 kind of axis. And this dashed line here shows where it lies on the Q2 axis. Okay, so we're going to look at these two terms. So first of all, we're going to consider the projection onto Q1 and V3. So the component um, of V3 that lies along this axis is this vector here that I'm going to draw in red. So that is projection onto Q1 of V3. And we look at our second term and say, okay, well, that's a projection onto Q2 of V3. So the component of V3 that lies along this axis. So I'm going to draw that here. So that is projection onto Q2 of V3. And then let's perhaps choose a different color for this next bit. So our Q3 is, what we're going to do is again, just kind of follow uh, geometrically this vector addition uh, that we see here. So it's V3, so we travel along V3 minus the projection onto Q1 of V3. So that's this vector here. So we travel along here and then we go backwards basically along Q1. We end up at a point above here on the Q2 axis. So we travel um, along here and then along there. And then minus the projection onto Q2 of V3, which is this vector here. So then we travel backwards along the Q2 axis to get to here. And so then what we end up with is Q3 being this vector, which as you can see geometrically is orthogonal to Q1 and Q2. So that gives an idea of how these, uh, using the projection operator and drawing some pictures, it gives you an idea of the, the geometry of everything that's, that's happening. So before we finish this video, it's worth noting some of the language around this because it can be a bit confusing. So this kind of operation, you might see it written as, for example, that Q3 is orthogonalized with respect to Q1 in Q2. So that's the first bit of language that you might see written. Or, for example, given the geometry of the thing we're looking at, you might say that um, Q3 is orthogonalized by taking V3 and removing its projections onto Q1 and Q2. So that's referring to the fact that we're taking off these kind of projection operators. Right, the final thing we need to do is make sure that the span of our new orthogonal vectors is equal to the span of the original linearly independent vectors. So um, remember that some kind of sketch of proof out here. Um, remember that Q1 is equal to, to V1. And so those vectors are pointing in the same direction. So by definition, the span of Q1 is going to be equal to the, the span of V1. Okay, so far so good. And then we remember that Q2 is equal to uh, V2 minus the projection onto Q1 of V2, okay? Well, Q1 is equal to V1. So what we've got is Q2 is made out of V2 and some sort of projection onto V1. So in other words, it's made out of a linear combination of, of the vectors V1 and V2. So from that, we know that the span of Q2 is equal to the span of V1 and V2. Like I say, because Q2 is made of a linear combination of V2 and some sort of projection onto V1. We keep going, so we'll do one more. So that Q3 is equal to, so remember it's going to be V3, 
minus the projection onto Q1 of V3 minus the projection onto Q2 of V3. Okay, so obviously there's a component of V3 in Q3. Uh, we have a projection again onto Q1, which is equal to V1. So we have a component um, acting in the, the V1 direction, if you like. And we also have a projection onto Q2. But we already, already know that Q2 can be expressed as a linear combination of V1 and V2. So if that's linear combination of V1 and V2, uh, this is in the V1 direction, and this is a component in the V3 direction. Um, so putting all that together means that the span of Q3 is going to be equal to the span of V1, V2, and V3. And we can continue with that logic um, to uh, arbitrary Q. So putting all that together, that means that, well, for this, this case, if Q3 is spanned by V1, V2, and V3, Q2 is spanned by V1 and V2, and Q1 is spanned by V1 only, um, if we put them all together, basically each one of these Qs can be expressed, so I'll go all the way to Qn, as a linear combination of Vs. And so it means that the space that's spanned by the Qs is equal to the space that's spanned by the Vs. Okay, and so that concludes everything. Uh, we've used the Gram-Schmidt method to create this orthogonal basis, which um, has the same span as our original linearly independent vectors. Uh, next video, I think we'll look at the QR algorithm, which is an interesting application of the Gram-Schmidt process.